tick diseases and pathogens. You know, each one costs money to do. So anyway, I was part of a, a research study, the independent, that was going to test more ticks than had ever been tested in Monroe County. And, uh, you know, it, it was, <clears throat> unfortunately, the, uh, the Berkeley parasitologist who was going to double check the research took early retirement and um, all the ticks I collected have still yet to be tested. They're in a freezer somewhere. But um, I did learn, you know, I, I used to dress like this and go up to the, um, the roadkill, the dead deer at the side of the road. And who knows what the drivers passing by thought, but uh, I, I wanted to know, you know, how infested are the deer around here, because they're all walking through my backyard. Um, you know, there, I would find handfuls of them at times, uh, especially around the genitals or their ears, but in general, nothing like the infestation of ticks that you find um, on deer in Connecticut. If you look at photos of deer in Connecticut or up farther north in areas of Canada, um, you know, up there you can get moose that are exsanguinated by all the ticks attached to them that they drop dead of blood loss. All right. Bite prevention. Do not brush by tall grass and bushes. So the biggest rule my kids know now is, you know, yes, we can be outside, but, you know, just don't let anything taller than mowed grass brush you if you can avoid it. That's the most likely place the ticks are going to be and they wait with their little front legs out. They wait to grab onto something. Um, wide paths with no low trees. Ticks sense carbon dioxide that people breathe out or that animals breathe out. And in areas with, uh, you know, the, there's enough of it here, but in areas where there's really dense infestation in um, Long Island or Connecticut, the ticks will be in the trees and they'll drop off. You know, they'll, they'll sense carbon dioxide going up and they'll start dropping, which is why you wear a wide-brimmed hat, because it's easier to see them on the hat than in your hair. Um, the newspapers always say, you know, wear light-colored clothes and wear long sleeves and long pants. And half the time they don't, they don't bother to say, you know, tuck them in. If you're not going to tuck the long pants into your socks, have bare legs. You can look at your bare legs, you know, I've got, depending on skin color, you can look at your, ba your bare legs for black specks. And um, if your pants aren't tucked in, you know, they just go right up your pant legs. And likewise, if you're not going to tuck in your shirt, they'll just, they just crawl up until they find the skin and you're going to find them later in your groin or something. They're, they're smart and persistent and it only takes them a few minutes to walk all the way up the back of your legs and, you know, go down your waistband. So, anyway, just think about it if, if you hunt or, you know, you do a lot of outdoor activities. Uh, frequent tick checks are the best and worth noting, lots of people load up on D. Oh, okay, I'm just going to spray down. Um, there's a great YouTube video where ticks are crawling all over a sneaker that's soaked in DEET, but they'll drop dead when they come in contact with a sneaker that was soaked in permethrin. So permethrin you can't spray on your skin, but socks and shoes and clothes, you let it dry and it, it um, offers better protection. Okay, so I, uh, I met a mother and she literally, Long Island mother, she literally makes her children strip naked on the front porch. <laughs> um, all right, the thing is, you know, you go in your house, you've just walked the dog at Men and Ponds Park or whatever, you go in your house, they're most likely to be on your clothes. So, you know, if you throw the clothes in a bag to bring it up to the washing machine, and then just note, ticks have been known to survive for an hour in the dryer. They're, uh, I think they're, they're on the... Uh, that Animal Planet show, like the most extreme creatures. Yeah, so, um, all right, and they love, yeah, they love the groin, underarms, ears, in the ears, you have to look in your ears. Ticks in the ears, yeah. And uh, then the scalp and hair, and you really actually need help to do that. Um, and so that's why I had duct tape on, and you know, every possible 
thing covered and you know I'd come back to my car and I'd find a dick crawling up my back and and then that whole suit got taken off and put in a big Ziploc bag and it got put in the bucket and sealed and anyway. Alright, so what many doctors need to learn, and <clears throat> nothing against the doctors, um, you know, there's a lot of misinformation and there are a lot of politics to do with Lyme disease and that have to do with the, some of the misinformation about it. Okay, so it's negligent not to test for Babesia, which is a protozoal parasitic infection. It's actually related to malaria and it can also be carried by mosquitoes. It is negligent not to test for that, Anaplasmosa, Ehrlichia, Bartonella, Rickettsia, and um, possibly other tick infections, depending on someone's health care complaints, their symptoms, when testing for Lyme, when looking to rule out Lyme, if, you know, I personally, if you talk to a Lyme litter doctor or myself, you can't ever really rule it out. Most non-Lyme literate doctors and people, again, you know, just think of the one bacteria and uh, that could not be more of a mistake. So, every tick is a cesspool of many pathogens and parasites, all of which can be transmitted in one bite. This is partly why Lyme disease is such a problem. It hits the immune system with several things all at once. So, this man, Dr. Stephen Fry, he's the one who told me ticks are cesspools and uh, owns Fry Laboratories out in Arizona. The description of, of how they sequence DNA isolated from patient samples of tissue and urine and they do the same thing with the tick itself. Um, and they individually sequence read and compare it to the National Center for Bioinformatics databases of all known organisms to find out what's in the person or what's in the tick. And so um, it's definitely true. He, he knows what he's talking about and that, you know, the idea that, well, this tick doesn't carry Lyme and some tick bites are okay, they're really all dirty. They really all carry a lot of stuff. Um, all right, so if you've caught wind of any of the Lyme documentaries or various books on Lyme, there's a lot of controversy about it, and you, I'll, I'm not going to just get into that much here, you know, and, and definitely money is involved, and, um, but ILADS, the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society, they are the resource not to forget. The lads, they're the good lads, they're the smiling, smiling guys. Um, the Infectious Disease Society of America, you know, now they are the national organization for the infectious disease doctors. And you know, Lyme disease is an infectious disease, so you would think they would be the people to go to or the experts, but um, that's not true they actually do not recognize that chronic Lyme exists, so they do not treat chronic Lyme. You know, they believe that Lyme is taken care of with a short course of antibiotics, and if you have symptoms after that, then you have post-Lyme infectious, uh, post-Lyme something, disease syndrome, psychiatric, you know. <laughs> um, it, it, it's not recognized that you still have the infection. So the doctors who truly have the information and the latest um, updates on Lyme are the ones that are in the thick of it and treat it all the time. Those are the ILADS, Lyme literate trained doctors. And um, you'll just run into a lot of frustration if you go see an infectious disease doctor about tick infections. <clears throat> okay, I already said this. Uh, so the negative result never means that you do not have Lyme disease or tick-borne disease. So local testing, the local test anywhere in America, it's based on one strain of Borrelia bacteria and it's a strain from Europe. It's not from the US. Um, IGENEX labs, they use three strains for testing and they include two strains from the US. And uh, 
you know, just to give you an idea, there are also, yeah, I think it's in your packet, something like 300 known strains of, of um, Borrelia anyway, and we're talking about a couple of them here. Okay, so now, now I'm going to get into the interesting stuff. What I think is interesting, um, really, this, um, this is only discussed, really, in certain circles of uh, Lyme groups, Lyme, di Lyme disease awareness, um, yeah, gr groups of the most progressive Lyme literate doctors um, talk about this understanding or theory and approach treating their patients this way. Some of them do, not all of them. Um, in fact, actually, uh, Dr. Richard Horowitz, who is wonderful and was one of our doctors, and he's the one that, who, broke, who wrote the book, um, Why Can't I Get Well? He has a very small section on parasites in his book, um, but I think that'll be changing in the future, especially with Dr. McDonald's discovery of the nematodes in the brain that were infected with Borrelia. So, this is a nematode, a human nematode in the blue, and next to it is a demodex skin mite. Probably upwards of 80 per to 90 percent of the people in this lecture hall right now have the demodex skin mites living and thriving on them and in their hair follicles, often around your eyebrows and eyelashes. The demodex skin mites are microscopic. They're so small we make antibodies against them, but they are, count them, they have eight legs and they are related to ticks and they live on us. Okay, so, all right, little, little more detail on Alan McDonald proving that the parasitic nematode worms harbor Lyme bacteria inside of them and were found in the human brains. It was with a 100% DNA match, and then that just lists what he found again. And what I want you to think about is that the new Lyme vaccine, before you run out and get it, and vaccines are a whole separate lecture, <laughs> and I'm a nurse who used to give lots of vaccines, um, but vaccines are a separate lecture, but the new Lyme vaccine only targets um, a certain type of protein they're saying it's better than the last vaccine that they took, out of, took off the market that had complications because it includes more than one OSP-A protein. It includes multiple proteins that are found on the Borrelia bacteria. But, you know, how effective is it going to be when Lyme disease is really not just about the one bacteria? It's really a bigger picture. You know, I mean, great if it protects you against Borrelia, but the, all the other things, the, you know, the tick carries, what about the Pawasan virus? It's just, you know, so they're going to, you know, the, the publicity is going to be, this is the answer, and I just want you to know the other thoughts to keep in your head about that Lyme vaccine. <clears throat> Dr. William Berdorfer, Berdorfer, I want to call him Berdorfer I because, you know, he's, He's the one that discovered the Borrelia bacteria, and it's named after him. He wrote about the nematodes being inside of the tick guts um, back in 1984. In 2014, Dr. Eva Sappi, um, she found that 30% of adult ticks contained nematodes. She actually did the research and, uh, you know, figured out a percentage out of a big sample she collected. All right, so something else um, with the cutting edge theory that I want you to understand is that people are simply more like cats and dogs than we like to admit or than uh, Western, Western medicine uh, thinks or, or, you know, seems to indicate in the U.S. They think we're really clean in the U.S., you know. We don't have parasites in the U.S. Um, you know, cats and dogs, they, they did a study where they had treated worms very intensely on a cat, 
and they did it generation after generation because you know you always have to deworm your cats, you always have to deworm your dogs when you get them, and uh, they discovered it took seven generations of treating the worms before they weren't passed down from the mother to the offspring. And uh, I just would like to put out there that you know. I think some of that goes on with people, you know, and, and that, you know, as time goes on, the, the um, research to back this up will be coming out in time. But, uh, all right, so we know the ticks are proven to carry the parasitic worms. Uh, other ways we get parasites, biting midges. If you go down to the Caribbean island, you go on a vacation, they carry filarial worms. Mosquitoes, they'll also transmit that protozoa parasite. The demodex skin mites, they are parasites and they colonize 20 to 80 percent of people, reaching uh, up to 100 percent the older people get. And then parasitic worm eggs are in soil and they get in our produce and our meat. Um, you know, people think we don't get parasitic worms because we cook our meat. You know, there is sushi, but, um, and that kind of worms. But, uh, the soil worm eggs also can be on, you know, lettuce and fruits and vegetables. All right. So just remember it going forward to do with all health care issues. Just remember it. That's my... All right. So this is frozen cod, you know, uh, from the grocery store with little nematodes. Uh, you know, nematodes are round worms. There are many different types probably heard of roundworms. So what happens with Lyme or MSIDS is you know you get an additive effect of with comorbidities. So you might have the set of infections you got from the tick bite and then you've got other factors from your life whether you eat sushi and you've got some liver flukes and didn't realize it and then you get the extra burden on your immune system with the tick bite and then those liver flukes start to proliferate um, While well, your body's busy taking care of the Borrelia. So, Borrelia in Chinese medicine, and I am an acupuncturist, so in traditional Chinese medicine, Borrelia would be called wind, a pathogen that holds the door open for all the other pathogens to come walking through. Uh, how it does this, so the vitamin D receptor, the VDR, the receptor expression is reduced by 50 times in monocytes by Borrelia burgdorferi. So it's doing something to our vitamin D receptor expression and function. And vitamin D function, the D receptor function, is essential for a healthy immune system. So it's turning off part of the immune system, working through, working on vitamin D. And, uh, and then the opportunistic infections, whether it's, you know, Epstein-Barr, which causes mononucleosis, whether you come in contact with that on the grocery store, store shopping cart after you're bitten by a tick, and then you rub your nose, you know, it's more likely to become a problem for you because your immune system's been hit. And by the way, um, Epstein-Barr is also carried by ticks. Many, many diseases are carried by ticks. Many herpes viruses carried by ticks. Okay, so why is Lyme so bad today? After all, the 5,300 year old ice mummy had Borrelia in him, you know, and why wasn't this such an issue? Why didn't people have these pain syndromes in, in our parents' generations? Um, some people say, okay, it's climate. There are just more ticks everywhere spreading Lyme disease. Some folks will tell you about biological warfare experiments on Plum Island in the 1950s off the coast of Lyme, Connecticut. If you're interested in that, um, there's a book published under fiction, had to be published under fiction, talking about the U.S. doing biological warfare experiments. Um, you know, the, the idea was that many different pathogens and diseases were all shoved into ticks on Plum Island, and they put these ticks on monkeys on Plum Island, and, you know, we're, we're seeing what would happen, and that migrating birds came through the monkey cages, and their migration path goes straight from Plum Island to Lyme, Connecticut. 
So you know, you can, there's a book you can read about that, but that is public. That is published under fiction. Um, you know, because it can't be proved, but it gets talked about a lot at the Lyme conferences. Um, you know, one of my daughters tested positive for a form of Ehrlichia that when I spoke to an entomologist up in Canada, he said, there's no way your daughter can have this, that disease. That's only carried by the Lone Star Tick in Texas. Has she ever been out west? And, you know, she hadn't been, but, you know, he brought up Plum Island to me, and he's an entomologist. All right, so um, additional food for thought to answer the question of why Lyme disease is such a big problem today. Um, I want you to keep food in mind, just hold the thought about food. And I'm not sure how many of you have heard about the human microbiome these days. They used to talk about, oh, we've got good beneficial gut flora in our intestines, helps us digest food. These microorganisms are beneficial. And they used, to, they used to talk about that for years. And now it's the microbiome. Now they realize we have symbiotic organisms all over our body through different tissues, 10 times as many microbial cells as human cells. And, you know, most of it's symbiotic. Um, you know, some of what's on our skin even protects us from having an infectious pathogen on our skin. You know, it helps the pH balance of our skin. But um, I want you to consider now, this is what really is cutting edge, progressive theory, partially proven, par partially backed up by research, um, is to consider the idea that parasites have their own microbiome too. You know, in case you didn't catch it, a parasite's different than a pathogen. Pathogen is single-celled. A parasite, some of them are single-celled, amoebas, protozoas, but they have a different sort of life cycle that they get designated into the parasite group. And many parasites are multi-celled. And so I am proposing the idea that parasites have their own microbiome and they don't just carry Borrelia bacteria inside of them, but they have the potential to house many pathogens inside of them. And um, even other things, even, you know, um, there are parasites that are in the human body for the better part of someone's lifetime. And I would go as far as to say, you know, when they start studying those parasites more closely, they'll find that they contain the same toxins inside the parasites that the person has in their body, maybe in a different concentration. You know, if someone's got high lead levels, their parasites are going to have high lead levels. They might even find human hormones and um, other things inside the parasites if these are creatures living inside of us. So I just want you to consider that, that idea, and what if Dr. McDonald, and I hope he does, tests for and looks for more than the Borrelia DNA inside those nematodes. You know, each, each different type of DNA they have to look for, it's, they have to decide to look for that specific infectious agent. So, I just described parasites really can be viewed as Ziploc bags. And even if you just take the, the research that's already known and you just say it's a Ziploc bag for Borrelia or a Ziploc bag for some other pathogens that are known to be inside of parasitic worms and parasitic skin mites, um, just think of them as Ziploc bags. So there's the, uh, the key to getting rid of Lyme disease really is um, to get rid of the parasites because a larger parasite can withstand antibiotics. You know, all these people, you know, the, the, the sad stories with Lyme, the people on antibiotics on and on and on for ages, and why doesn't the infection go away? Um, there is something called biofilm, which also is, you know, there, there are multiple reasons why the antibiotics have a hard time, and biofilm is similar to the parasites in terms of hiding smaller infections inside of it. 
but um, this the parasites are definitely not always killed off by antibiotics. You know, they take bigger, hardcore medications, uh, many of which are toxic. Our family was on a hardcore anti-parasite drug to get rid of the protozoa. Uh, gosh, the better part of a year, you know, and it's 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 the same drug used to get rid of malaria. And it did not get rid of the protozoa infection in me. I, you know, I was on it for almost a year, off it, had to go back on it. Um, all right, so the ento entomopathogenic nematodes. Here's the other research that's been done about the infections being inside of parasites. All right, 2002, Wolbachia is found to be part of the cause of river blindness, not just the worms like they used to think. 2006, this photorhabdis bacteria, which actually glows in the dark, an um, emerging pathogen in the US that was transferred to a 49-year-old man digging in the dirt, got an injury, and they found out that the bacteria was symbiotic and was not in the dirt and only grew within the nematode in the dirt. Um, 2012, the Bacillus oleroneus bacteria that's linked with rosacea, um, where people get a red face, um, that was isolated from the Demodex skin mites. And Mycobacterium ulcerans associated with M. perstans nematodes in people. Okay, so keeping the food and the worm, worms in mind, genetically modified food today, the soy and the beet fields, the soy and the beet crops are um, the biggest genetically modified crops. And the nematodes affect the crops as well. You know, there are diff different types of nematodes and we don't know what kind um, Alan McDonald found in the human brain at this point. I don't know what type of nematode that was, but there's no way that we don't eat some of these nematodes. Um, an article was pulled off the internet which had the research done that showed that the nematode eggs from beet sugar survived processing. And, and the article had a, had a bowl of sugar and was saying, you know, there are worm eggs in this bowl of sugar. Today, if you don't know it, unless you buy organic sugar, all sugar is largely beet sugar, genetically modified beet sugar. The white sugar you buy at the store, my understanding is about 50% of it's cane sugar, 50% is beet sugar, and so, it may contain um, the eggs of these nematodes. So every time you have anything with sugar in it, you could potentially be eating nematode eggs. Now, you know, we've eaten parasite eggs as long as humans have been on the earth because they're in the soil and, and food grows in the soil, but these nematodes in the genetically modified crops, they are resistant to the Bt toxin, which is the toxin that's in corn, it's spliced into the genetically modified crops as a pesticide, and the worms aren't harmed by it. There's still a big problem for the genetically modified crops. So, um, so, so when they don't have any other competitors in those genetically modified crops, no other pathogens and fungi, you know, the soils change because everything dies on the pesticide sprayed and the genetically modified.